Lord be with you. Well, very happy new year to you if I haven't already seen you. Welcome to this talk from St. John's in Highbridge for the Feast of the Baptism of Christ. Let's begin with the Collect prayer for that Sunday. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, at the Jordan you revealed Jesus as your Son. May we recognise him as our Lord and know ourselves to be your beloved children. Through Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Amen. The reading for today is Luke chapter 3, verses 15 to 17, and then picking up again at verse 21 and reading on to verse 22 tells the story, of course, of Jesus' baptism at the hands of John the Baptist. So here's my reflection on that Gospel reading. In the bleakness, baptism. And in the baptism, blessing. And in the blessing, life. January has always felt uh, to me, to be the bleakest month of the year. The feasting of Christmas is over. The bonhomie of New Year has begun to fade. And on Twelfth Night, many of us packed up our decorations with a sigh. Now in the church, the season of Epiphany makes a valiant attempt at keeping the festal flame alive. But the rest of the world has largely moved on. And even we can't help feeling weighed down by this dark and leaden month. Now, in my slightly contrary way, I have something of a fondness for bleak things. Maybe it's because I was born in February, or maybe it's my Scottish dourness. But I do quite often like to escape into bleak worlds. Hannah always makes me remember one sun-kissed holiday in France, sitting in the shade reading a book, and it wasn't some light, summery page-turner, but it was Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment. Hannah just rolled her eyes at me and sipped her orangina. Now, the book I chose to read a couple of summers ago was Cormac McCarthy's The Road, Published in 2006, it won the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction. And if you don't know it, I'll give you a basic idea of the story. The book is set in a post-apocalyptic America. Some unspecified environmental disaster has destroyed almost all of life, strewing the country with a film of toxic ash. Society has collapsed and people have gone feral, hoarding supplies of food, and when it runs out, turning to cannibalism and other unspeakable acts. The book's main characters are a father and son, who count themselves among what they call the good guys. And what they mean by that phrase, the good guys, is they mean that they refuse cannibalism and survive only on what they can scavenge. Now, the pair don't have names in the novel. They're simply referred to as the man and the boy. And they're on their way to the coast where they hope to survive the harsh winter. And the story follows their long and arduous journey through violence, sickness and fear. Like I said, it's not the kind of book that most people take to read on the beach. Now had the road been written 20 years earlier, it would have seemed like a far-fetched work of science fiction. But reading it today, in the light of environmental catastrophe, global terror, and now the pandemic, the book seems ominous and prophetic, rather like John the Baptist at the start of today's Gospel. But despite this bleakest of scenarios, The Road is in fact a very life-affirming book, and that's why I want to talk about it. At the core of the novel is the beautifully observed relationship between father and son. And their survival isn't just about physical sustenance, 
but about their relationship. The love they share is at the heart of the book. It is the heart of the book. And it's mutual. The father protects and cares for his son, defending him and comforting him when horrific things happen. But the son, too, by his very dependence upon his papa, provides the man with hope and a reason to keep going where all other hope has fled. I want to share with you one scene from the road that is quite shocking, and I've toned it down a little, but do be prepared. The man and the boy have had a violent altercation with someone that they meet on the road, who threatens the boy, and his father is forced to shoot the stranger, and his son ends up covered in the dead man's blood. Like I said, it's not pretty. But the father and son do escape, and they manage to find a safe place to light a fire and to eat from their meagre supplies. And let me read to you what comes next. After they'd eaten, he took the boy out on the gravel bar below the bridge and he pushed away the thin shore ice with a stick and they knelt there while he washed the boy's face and his hair. The water was so cold, the boy was crying. They moved down the gravel to find fresh water and he washed his hair again, as well as he could, and finally stopped because the boy was moaning with the cold of it. He dried him with the blanket, kneeling there in the glow of the light with the shadow of the bridge's understructure broken across the palisade of tree trunks beyond the creek. This is my child, he said. I wash a dead man's blood out of his hair. That is my job. Then he wrapped him in the blanket and carried him to the fire. The boy sat, tottering. The man watched him that he not topple into the flames. He kicked holes in the sand for the boy's hips and shoulders where he would sleep and sat holding him while he tousled his hair before the fire to dry it. All of this like some ancient anointing. So be it. Evoke the form where you've nothing else, construct ceremonies out of the air and breathe upon them. Well, there's a piece of writing that's both terrible and beautiful. And to me, what's being described there is a kind of baptism. The boy is held and washed by his father. He's washing away the stain of violence and murder things that have been left clinging to this innocent boy's hair like some kind of original sin. The faint light from their campfire illuminates the arch of the bridge under which they are cowering like a makeshift candle and a makeshift font. It's like a ritual, or as the father puts it, some ancient anointing. And it's born out of the very bleakness and trauma of their situation where you've nothing else, construct ceremonies out of the air and breathe upon them. Now there's one key phrase that the Father says, which is almost a direct quotation from today's Gospel reading. This is my child, the Father says. And this, of course, is what was heard by Jesus from his own Father in heaven at the moment of his own baptism when he rose gasping from the River Jordan and the Spirit descended on him like a dove. This is my child. So why have I bothered to share this extract from the road and point out its similarities to the Gospel? Well, it's because I think it gets to the heart of things. The blessing within the bleakness. And it gives us a clue to the sacrament of baptism, on this feast of the baptism of Christ. Life leaves all kinds of stains upon us. Some are self-inflicted, the desolate things we willingly choose. Others, like the experience of the boy in the road, are the tragic side effects of a fallen and violent world. But the outward symbolism of water points to that inner cleansing 
that comes through the acceptance of love. When we recognise our need of a Father's love, then that inner cleansing work can begin. Now, I don't know what bleakness you might be facing in your life right now. It may be that you're doing all right, and I praise God for that. But for all of us, there are times when we say, actually, I'm not all right. Things have been pretty bleak, and it's not looking like they're going to get much better. That's the truth of human experience at times. And it seems to be in the air somehow at this bleak time of year. So what encouragement can I offer us today? Well, the best I can do is to repeat that phrase that we've heard already in two places now. The voice of a father saying, this is my child. And this is the truth into which we must be baptised today. That you and I are God's children. We must all take the plunge into the cold and breathtaking water of that truth. That we are none of us in charge of our own lives. We are all of us utterly dependent on God in whom we live, move and have our being. We must all face up to the bloodiness and bleakness of our lives, owning our own stains and letting him wash us clean. This sounds easy, but it's not. We've learned, most of us, to be adults, to be confident and in control. But Jesus says, we need to learn to be little children again, knelt by, washed, wrapped, held and tousled by the fire. This is the saving work of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Jesus the Son, the bloodied and beloved who saves us from sin by plunging himself into the fragility of the human condition. And it's God the Father who raises him from the dead, a new man for a new humanity. And it is God the Holy Spirit who bears this whole marvellous gospel into our hearts on snow-white wings so that it might be real for me, here, today. So what are we going to do with that truth? Are we going to let it just scroll past the screens of our minds? Troubling, elegant, alluring, but ultimately just things in a book. Are we going to leave God's offer of grace on the page? Or are we going to dive in and be transformed? The offer is there. The choice is yours. And it goes something like this. In the bleakness, baptism. In the baptism, blessing. And in the blessing, life. Amen.